welcome i welcome you all to this lecture in the course sandhi in paninian grammar in this course so far we studied the very basic facts that are necessary to understand better the sandhi in paninian grammar we studied the process of speech production as described in paniniya shiksha and studied the stages of the process of speech production described therein we said that this description says that there are two stages which are initial stages which are part of the cognitive apparatus and it is they which act as the cause of the most external expression in the form of the audible speech thus the cognitive stage acts as the cause and the external most audible speech acts as the effect there is this cause and effect relationship that can be in this way explained we then also studied the meaning of the word sandhi and how it aptly describes this important concept in the paninian grammar in the previous lecture we also studied how the term sandhi is used in various disciplines like natya shastra and artha shastra whereas in the artha shastra the term sandhi is used to indicate the policy of the state namely the peace and in the natya shastra the term sandhi is used for the segments of the plot and the plot development depends on the development of these sandhis in this way the term sandhi used in these two different domains dramaturgy and also the political science has deep connotations in paninian grammar the term sandhi is used to indicate a substitute the paniniya shiksha describes the process of speech production in which meaning collection is described as the very first stage and the location of this meaning collection is the intellect now this meaning collection stands as the base and can be considered as what is described as prasanga or sthana and in this particular sthana comes another substitute this is what is a general methodology used by panini we also studied two basic principles underlying sandhi one of them is samhita and the other one is vivaksha in this lecture we shall study them in little bit more detail first we delve deep into the concept of samhita what is samhita this is the first very basic question the term samhita is defined by panini in his ashtadhyayi 14109 and the sutra is parah sanikarshah samhita this is a saudhnya sutra 
This sutra defines a technical term. Samhita is a technical term. Paraha Sannikarshaha is what is signified, is what is the saudni. Paraha is one one of para, high or extreme. Sannikarshaha is one one of Sannikarsha, the proximity. So overall, what this sutra means is that high proximity or extreme proximity of sounds or of verbal elements is termed Samhita, as simple as that. This is the simple answer. What is Samhita? High proximity of sounds or verbal elements is Samhita. The next question is what is this proximity? But before answering this question, let us also study how this Sutra Parasarnikarsha Samhita is interpreted by a very celebrated text written in the 17th century by a great scholar called Bhattoji Dikshit and the name of his text is Vayakarana Siddhanta Kaumudi abbreviated as VSK over here. Now VSK says Varnanam Atishaitas Sannidhihi Samhita Saudhnyasyat. So this Atishaitas Sannidhihi, this is what is Samhita. What it means is the extreme proximity of sounds is termed Samhita. Atishaitas Sannidhi. So the next question is what is this extreme proximity? What is this high proximity or extreme proximity? What is the difference between extreme proximity and just proximity? In order to understand this, we need to go little backwards in time and study the text of Kashika Vritti, also referred to over here by its abbreviated form KV. Now KV says that Paro Yastani Karshaha Varnanam Ardhamatra Kalab Vyavadhanam Sa Samhita Saudhnyo Bhavati. So what this means is that the extreme proximity which amounts to the gap of only half a matra time between the sounds is termed Samhita. This is how the term Samhita is explained in the text of the Kashika Vritti. What it means is that there is extreme proximity between sounds and such sounds when uttered together they are called Samhita. So the extreme proximity amounts to two sounds to be uttered one after another in such a way that there exists only a gap of half a matra time between them. This is the important explanation of this extreme proximity or high proximity, different than just the sannikarsha, just the proximity. Now we come back to the 18th century text called Brihat Shabdendu Shekhara in which the explanation of the Kashika Vritti is further refined and interpreted in the following manner which is quoted on the slide. The text Brihat Shabdendu Shekhara is referred to on the slide with the abbreviation namely B S and S, B S S, Brihat Shabdendu Shekhara. Now what Brihat Shabdendu Shekhara says over here is that Paragrahanetu Tatsamarthyat Ardhamatra Kalatirikta Kalab Vyavaya Bhavarupa Sannikarshasya Grahanat Na Doshaha Sannikarshasya Vachit Purvena Prayaha Parena What it means is no problem remains once we interpret the word Atishayita in the following way by force of the utterance of the word Para the proximity of the form of absence of the gap more than half a matra time is intended to be termed Samhita. This proximity is sometime with an earlier sound and mostly it is with the latter sound. So, Ardha matra 
कालातिरिक्त काल व्यवाय अभाव रूप स निकर्ष सो अर्ध मात्रा काल अतिरिक्त एक्स्ट्रा 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 काल एक्स्ट्रा टाइम व्यवाय व्यवाय इज द गैप एबसेंस एबसेंस ऑफ द गैप ऑफ एक्स्ट्रा टाइम एक्स्ट्रा दैन अदर दैन द हाफ मात्रा टाइम so this is that sannikarsh which does not have more than half a matra time gap in between what this means is that when two sounds are uttered they are uttered with a minimum gap in between this is what is assumed over here it is this particular gap which helps clear and distinct comprehension of these two sounds so we note that this particular gap is unavoidable between two sounds now not to have more gap than this natural one is what is described as high or extreme proximity which is what is described to result in samhita so when two sounds are uttered and in between them there isn't more gap than half a matra natural gap half a matra natural gap is required so that the two sounds will have distinct comprehension but nothing more than that when such an absence of more gap is visible then we say that this is the parasya nikarsha this is that extreme proximity which results in samhita this is what is samhita let us now look at the derivation of the word samhita in the previous lecture we looked at the derivation of the word sandhi on that background it is very important to note how the word samhita is derived so we take the verbal root dha meaning dharana poshana yo in this case it is dharana together with the preverb sam and so we have sam plus dha and to them to the verbal root dha we add the suffix t in the sense of karma by 32102 nishtha after that this dha is substituted by hi because this t is kit so we have the sutra dadhate hi hi which substitutes this dha with hi so we have some he and the then we add the feminine suffix a over here some plus he plus the plus a by 414 and so we get the form samhita what it means literally is something that is being collectively put together or held together this something is the meaning of the suffix the being collectively collectively is the meaning of the preverb sum put together or held together is the meaning of the verbal root dha and also the preverb sum in this way samhita means something being collectively put or collectively held together the question is what is this something which is collectively held together the answer is the sounds which convey one meaning unit generally and the sounds which are in high or extreme proximity the sounds are in high and extreme proximity mainly because they are conveying one and the same meaning unit this is what is the meaning of the term samhita so what happens when there is an absence of samhita this state exists where sounds are being just put together as combinations but not in high or extreme proximity they are uttered in proximity but not in a high degree of proximity so they are uttered close to one another but not very close to one another they do have gap more than half a matra time which is required for the distinct comprehension of the sounds they have more gap than that and that is the reason why 
they are not in the extreme or high degree of proximity. They are uttered with more gap than what is naturally required for distinct comprehension of sounds. Such a stage can be called as apahita, something being distinctly held or put together or vyavahita, something being, being held together or put together with hindrances in terms of the additional time gap in between. So this is what is absence of samhita. So here we have the instances karmani, eva, adhikaraha, te, ma, phaleshu, kadachana, ma, karma phalahetuhu, bhuhu, ma, te, sangaha, astu and akarmani. All these elements they are stated together with the word boundary indicated by the vertical bar after each one of them. So these sounds are uttered in combination, they are uttered in proximity, karmani, eva, but this is not that high degree of proximity in which you leave only that much gap which is required for the clear and distinct pronunciation. In this case you are leaving some more gap in between, karmani, eva, eva, adhikaraha. Adhikaraha te, te ma, ma phaleshu, phaleshu kadachana, kadachana ma, ma karma phalahetuhu, karma phalahetuhu bhuhu, bhuhu Ma, ma, te, te, sangaha, sangaha, astu, astu, akarmani. You see, this is that gap. This is more than what is required for the distinct comprehension of the two sounds. So there is vyavadhana, there is additional hindrance of the time gap. So this is a way of uttering the sounds which can be aptly called as vyavahita or apahita mode of utterance as opposed to samhita. But then this is samhita, karmani eva adhikaraha te ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phalahetuhu bhuhu Ma te sangahastu akarmani. Now, in this case, we try to utter these words leaving only that much gap which is required for the distinct comprehension of the sound, and we did not have more gap than what is naturally required. So, this is now samhita. Karmani eva adhikaraha te ma phaleshu kadachana. Ma karma palahituhu bhuhu ma te sangaha astu akarmani. That's all. Now, when this samhita happens, we have this adhikara samhita yam. This is the adhikara sutra. What it means is in the domain of samhita. So, when samhita is intended to be done by the speaker, both samhita as well as apahita or vyavahita are dependent on the desire of the speaker, also known as vivaksha. So when the speaker has the desire to speak in samhita mode, the sounds undergo modifications and these modifications are called sandhi, plain and simple. Now this samhita is also obligatory in some cases, in some environments. Now this verse taken from the Paninian grammatical tradition describes those environments. It says, Samhitaika pade nitya, nitya dhatu pasargayoho, nitya samase, vaketu sa vivaksham apekshate. What it means is, Samhita eka pade nitya. Samhita is obligatory. 
Samhita is obligatory within a pad, within a word. Nitya dhatu upasarga yoho. It is obligatory between a verbal root or dhatu and a preverb or upasarga. Nitya samase. It is obligatory in a compound. But in the sentence, it expects the desire to speak. This is how the Nitya Samhita is explained. And here are the examples. The example of Samhita within a Pada is this Agni followed by the suffix am. And then by doing the Sandhi, which is called Purvarupa Sandhi, we get the word Agnim. This is obligatory. Agnim. There is no other option. Similarly, the Samhita is obligatory between a Dhatu, a verbal root, and an Upasarga, a preverb. A preverb or an Upasarga already, always precedes the Dhatu. So here we have Adhi plus E, where, is, where E is the verbal root and Adhi is the preverb, and we have the suffix Te. And we generate the form Adhi Te. In this case, Adhi and E, Adhi is the preverb, Upasarga, E is the Dhatu. So Samhita in between them is a must, is obligatory. Adhi Te, this is how it should be uttered. Then we have the case of Samasa, the compound. So in a compound like Gana plus Isha and the resultant form with the Sandhi is Ganesha, which is a Guna Sandhi. So this Ganesha is the resultant form by application of the grammatical rule. So in all these three cases, Agni Am, Adhi E Te, Gana Isha, these are not allowed by the grammatical rules. The grammatical rules say that you don't have any choice of doing the Samhita optionally. Now, in case of Agnim Pashya, where you have Ma pronounced and also written in this particular form, Agnim Pashya with the space in between, and we also have Agnim Pashya, where this Ma is converted into a an anaswara, and so you have agnim pashya. Now, in both these cases, where in this case there is samhita, and in this case there is no samhita, this is dependent on the desire of the speaker. So, when there is no samhita, there is no rule that applies, so there is no grammatical rule application involved. But when you have samhita, the grammatical rules apply. So this is supported, Agnim Pashya, is supported by both Vivaksha as well as the grammatical rule. Whereas in this case, Agnim Pashya, only the Vivaksha is playing some role over here. And there is no grammatical rule supporting this particular fact. So what is the relation between Samhita and Sandhi? As we have already seen, Samhita is a precondition for Sandhi to take place. That means if Samhita is there, only then Sandhi will take place, not otherwise. So Samhita can be called a cause for Sandhi to take place. And so it is important to note that, note that it is not a coincidence that both the words Samhita and Sandhi are derived from the same verbal root Dhatu namely dha and with the same preverb or upasarga sam. So we must note that the sandhis are explained by the rules of grammar. There are various rules of grammar which express and explicitly state and explain the sandhi. And they do it in accordance with the desire of the speaker. And the speaker does not wish to do the Samhita, no Sandhi takes place. 
such cases where vivaksha favors not doing samhita they are not explained by grammatical rules they are explained as they follow only vivaksha in such cases where only vivaksha follows no grammatical rules are applied so once again let us compare samhita and sandhi so as far as the samhita part is concerned we have karmani eva adhikarah te ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phal hetu bhuhu ma te sangah astu akarmani so this is samhita and now because there is samhita there is sandhi that is taking place and then it is merging the word boundaries and making the sentential effect to take place so you have karmanye vadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phal hetur bhur ma te sangostu akarmani this is the verse which has all the sandhis main inside and this sandhi process is based on the utterance of this particular verse in the samhita mode if we did not utter this verse in the samhita mode there won't be any possibility for the sandhi operations to take place all the sutras dealing with sandhi are stated in the domain heading samhitayam at sandhi for example at sandhi means vowel sandhi states stated in the domain heading samhitayam stated at 6172 hal sandhi or consonant sense sandhi is stated mainly in the domain heading samhitayam namely 82108 similarly visarga sandhi also is stated mainly in the domain heading samhitayam 82108 now these are some of the types of sandhis we have already mentioned at sandhi hal sandhi and visarga sandhi let us quickly look at them at sandhi or vowel sandhi is a term used for that sandhi that happens in place of a vowel so a vowel is a substantive and an another element comes in place of this vowel this sandhi is called ach sandhi or one vowel comes in place of two vowels this is also called at sandhi hal sandhi which is also termed as consonant sandhi is the one that happens in place of a consonant this is what is hal sandhi a visarga sandhi is a sandhi that happens in place of a visarga and also in the form of a visarga and sometimes also in place of the substantive end of the visarga all these three they are collected together under what is known as visarga sandhi in order to describe the sandhi panini has effectively used the cases the vibhaktis there are three cases which are metalinguistically assign the role of demarcating the environment for the sandhi to be explained and there are these three cases fifth case sixth case and seventh case there is also the first case which comes quite naturally along with the sixth case so the fifth case means immediately after the word seventh case stands for immediately before and the sixth case indicates in place of or instead of so the sixth case means in place of or instead of now how are these cases used to describe the sandhi so suppose we have a sutra of this kind x plus 5 5 indicates the fifth case plus y plus 6 plus z plus 7 plus a plus 1 now the first case when used in combination with the sixth case indicates the substitute and here we have the sutra x plus 5 plus y plus 6 plus z plus 7 plus a plus 1 what is the meaning of this sutra what this sutra means is that immediately after x because fifth case 
means immediately after, immediately after x and immediately before z. Seventh case means immediately before. Substitute y by a. y is the substituent, a is the substitute. What we can describe over here is that x is the left hand side environment also described as Purva Sannikarsha, z is the right hand side environment also described as the Para Sannikarsha, y is the element that gets substituted. So y is a substituent also known as Sthanin and a is the element that substitutes the substituent. So a is called an Adesha. This is what is Sandhi. So we have the input of this kind x plus y plus z and the output would be by the application of this sutra the output would be x plus a plus z where a is substituting y when y comes immediately after x and immediately before z. In the respective environments a substitutes y and so this is what is called as a sandhi. It is also important for us to take a quick look at the derivation process that is a mainstay of the Paninian grammar. Now in this derivation process of the sentence first comes the collection of meanings Atma Buddha Samityarthan and this involves also their combinations, combinations of the lexical items into the sentence meaning. Second is the collection of words with their combinations in correspondence with the meanings. The third is the processing of the words by application of various rules. And the fourth one is the rules dealing with the Sandhi. Thus the stage of applying the Sandhi rules comes only at the end. And generally after applying these rules no further process happens. So this is the final process that the grammar does on the derived form. The output of Sandhi process is generally not the input of any other process with only one exception and that exception is the fifth stage of the derivation process namely dealing with the swaras or the accents and sandhi output can become the input for the swara process. Output of the rules of at sandhi or vowel sandhi are input to the swara rules. So these rules are stated in 6.1 before the rules describing the swara. Rules describing the hal sandhi or consonant sandhi are stated in 8.2 onwards and we know that in 8.2 section onwards the output of these rules is not visible to the earlier rules. Earlier 29 subsections are not aware of these last 3 subsections 8.2, 8.3 and 8.4. Similarly Visarga Sandhi is stated in 8.3 onwards where the output of the rules is not visible earlier. All this happens primarily because the sandhi comes only at the final stage of the derivation process when the pada boundaries are to be erased and sentential effects are to be generated. We also note that augment is also considered as a type of sandhi and we are going to study several examples indicating this particular fact. Augments get added in some limited environments. So these aug augments are also considered to be substitutes by the later Paninian grammatical tradition starting from Patanjali onwards where Patanjali says anagamakanam sagamaka adeshaha. So those, those words which do not have an augment in place of them come the words together with the augment. Therefore the words together with the augment are considered to be the substitutes and the words without an augment are considered to be the substituent. And so 
And these agamas or augments which get added are also considered to be sandhi. And this is one example for you. We have sugan followed by isha, ishaha. And so A332 applies over here and the augment is added after sugan and after isha. And because of the marker t, this na is added before this isha. And so we have Sugandnisha. So na comes at the end of Sugand and so we have Sugandnisha. So this technicality we shall study later on about the augment and there will be several augments that we shall study in the course of this particular course. To summarize what we have said so far, we can say that Samhita and Sandhi are closely associated. Sandhi takes place in the environment of Samhita and not otherwise. Samhita is dependent on the desire of the speaker. The grammar of Panini explains the rules, explains with rules Sandhi done in the environment of Samhita. Thus the forms with Sandhi are supported by both Vivaksha as well as the grammar of Panini and therefore can be called grammatical in a sense. Now we shall study the Ach Sandhi and the other types of Sandhi in the subsequent lectures in this particular course. Thank you very much.